Good morning, my name is Sandra Allison. I am currently the Director of Ultrasound at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. and I will be lecturing about transplant sonography. All right, this next lecture is transplant sonography and I'm going to go over some of the more common abnormalities found as well as some of the more unusual findings. Okay, at Georgetown we have uh, several types of organ transplants. We have liver transplants, kidney, pancreas with some kidney, you know, kidney pancreas combinations. We are also one of the few centers that have small bowel transplants and multivisceral visceral transplants, which include small bowel, but may also include uh, pancreas or, and or liver. For the purpose of this talk, I will be going over imaging of liver and kidney transplants. Moving right on to liver transplants, liver transplants are performed for treating end-stage liver disease, and it's important to know that there are actually more than one type. There is whole liver transplantation, but now uh, in the setting of decreasing supply, split liver um, transplants can be performed as well as living donor uh, liver transplantation. Ultrasound is the initial imaging modality of choice for following up liver transplants but also detecting complications. Liver transplantation is performed when life expectancy without transplant is less than life expectancy following the procedure. The most common indication for a liver transplant currently is hepatitis C followed by alcohol abuse and cryptogenic cirrhosis. Okay, so it's important to know when you're evaluating a liver transplant the surgical technique. And it may vary a little or there may have been some uh, different part of the procedure performed due to variant anatomy in either the donor or in the recipient. But the basic technique involves an end-to-end -end biliary anastomosis, which is also called a colidoco cholidocostomy, a hepatic artery anastomosis, which is also end-to-end, -end, an end-to-end -end portal vein anastomosis, and then either an end-to-end -end IVC anastomosis with the anastomosis performed both with the supra and infrahepatic vena cava, or what is called a piggyback anastomosis, which is an end-to-side anastomosis between the transplanted liver and the intact donor vena cava. And as I mentioned earlier, knowledge of the anatomy is, is key to evaluating liver transplants and knowing where to look at the vessels and where to look at the anastomoses. The other thing that's important is knowing whether a whole or split liver transplant was performed because in the setting of a split liver transplant, you do not want to mistake uh, for example, a bifurcation of one supplying portal vein into a right and left portal vein. Our routine postoperative study includes a grayscale evaluation to document either any collections, to look at the biliary tree, and also to look at the overall appearance of the transplant. The vascular anastomoses are evaluated with Doppler. And I, I put this in here because I think this is one of the most important parts of the talk, which is knowledge of the anatomy. Complications to transplants include complications to the vasculature, the biliary duct, the parenchyma, the perihepatic space, which includes collections. And again, complications vary slightly between uh, pediatric and adult transplants. This is the normal appearance to the hepatic arterial waveform. You can see that there is a brisk upstroke and continuous supply to the liver during both systole and diastole. A normal resistive index, which is shown here, is between 0.5 to 0.8. And a normal acceleration time, which is not measured here, is less than 0.08 seconds. Uh, complications of hepatic arteries include thrombosis, stenosis, and pseudoaneurysm. Hepatic 
artery thrombosis is the most common vascular complication. It occurs in up to 8% of transplants and accounts for 60% of all post-transplant vascular complications. It's the second leading cause of early graft failure, and it usually occurs early within the first 15 days, either due to acute rejection or prolonged cold ischemia time in the graft or uh, due to small vessels in the graft. It can also occur delayed in the delayed setting many years after transplantation, either due to chronic rejection or uh, due to stenosis in the hepatic artery. This may present with fulminant hepatic failure, uh, delayed biliary leak relating from biliary necrosis, and uh, relapsing bacteremia and sepsis. Up to 60% of these patients uh, would require retransplantation, but even after retransplantation, the mor mortality rate approaches 30%. Okay, and here's an image taken at the porta hepatis three days after transplantation, and you can see that the portal vein is very easy to see, but uh, a hepatic artery is not that obvious. Even um, using the spectral Doppler and kind of marching around that area, it was very hard to detect arterial flow. The important thing to see here is a comparison with the first day where the hepatic artery was uh, patent and also just very easy to find. And so just this large difference from day to day is already um, an indication of an abnormality or a complication and uh, is concerning for hepatic arterial thrombosis. Now in my, my word slide, I made a comment at the bottom of a syndrome of impending thrombosis. And really what it is, is it's a recognizable pattern that may indicate uh, that a thrombosis will happen. You can see a progressive decrease of systolic and diastolic flow with the diastolic flow eventually uh, becoming absent. And then we can see it, we may or may not see a dampening of the systolic peak, sort of like a parvus tardis waveform. And finally, a total loss of the hepatic waveform. You can see that uh, in this patient immediately post-op, you can see a normal hepatic arterial pattern in the right hepatic artery. Uh, actually, this is near where the main hepatic artery is, and you can see a brisk upstroke and continuous forward diastolic flow. The resistive index is 0 0.73, which is normal. On follow-up, next day, you can see that the peak systolic velocity has now decreased from 83 to 27 centimeters per second. The diastolic velocity has also decreased from 22 to 14 centimeters per second. Again, the follow-up examination demonstrates further decrease in the peak systolic velocity and end diastolic velocity and possibly dampening of the uh, systolic peak. And again, you can see here a progression, further decrease in velocity, further dampening of the systolic peak, and um, eventually a loss of diastolic flow. And here you can see uh, the resistive index is 1, and the peak systolic velocity has really decreased, and this patient presented, or, or sorry, uh, proceeded to thrombosis hepatic artery, which was proven at angiography. Okay, so again, this is a very good example of why the knowledge of anatomy is very important. In this patient, there was already a large concern for hepatic arterial thrombosis, and hepatic arterial flow could not be found in the hepatic parenchyma. But the hepatic artery uh, was not easily found. And it turns out, um, with communication with a surgeon, this patient actually necessitated a jump graft extending between the aorta to the liver. And he uh, drew us a diagram and showed us that the jump graft was extending, was above the celiac artery. So we went back to the patient, we looked for the aorta, and we looked for the celiac artery, which I don't have in these images, but superior to this, you can actually see the graft extending off the aorta. You can see the graft flow in it for a very short distance, but then after that, you can see thrombosis of the graft. So this is important because when they went in, they went right in this area, and according to the surgeon, 
right in this area, the surgical knot was projecting into the lumen of the graft, and this is, was the nidus for thrombosis. Okay, it's important to communicate with the surgeons, as I said, uh, as to the anatomy and especially when they deviate from protocol. And I just wanted to show this picture because the picture really truly is worth a thousand words. And when you can see here, this is, you know, different institutions can have forms that the surgeons fill out. We're a little less formal, but we do uh, on occasion require a drawing from them just to show you the variant anatomy so that when we go in and evaluate the patient, we know where to look for the anastomoses. And this is just an example of one such patient where an iliac arterial uh, jump graft was necessitated. And from the drawing here, it looks like it's extending from below the renal arteries and coming up and supplying the liver. And so uh, a lot of times when we want to look at the anastomoses, we have to look here and then we have to look where the second um, anastomosis of the jump draft is with the hepatic arterial system. Okay, moving on to hepatic arterial stenosis. This occurs in 5 or up to 11 uh, percent of liver transplant recipients. It usually occurs at the site of anastomosis um, and within three months of transplantation. Uh, this, the causes include clamp injury, there may be intimal trauma, either from the presence of a perfusion catheter or from disruption of the vasovasorum, um, with resultant ischemia of the arterial ends. This can lead to thrombosis and ischemia of the biliary tree, biliary strictures, sepsis, and graft loss. The criteria we use is a peak hepatic arterial systolic velocity greater than 200 centimeters per second, um, you may or may not see an intrahepatic tardis parvus with a resistive index of less than 0 0.5 or an accelerator, acceleration time greater than 0 0.08 seconds. And again, the importance of this is that it may lead eventually to hepatic arterial thrombosis. And this is actually a patient who's had her transplant two years before this examination. And you can see that when we were evaluating the right hepatic artery, uh, a parvus tardis waveform was seen. The resistive index in this case was 0 0.37. We see uh, a little bit of a slope here. And the uh, same similar pattern in the left hepatic artery. So we, we looked a little bit more closely in the region of the porta hepatis, and you can see on this image, you know, frequently, frequently with stenosis, the hepatic arteries can be pretty difficult to find. Perhaps they're small or they're you know, they may be somewhat removed from the portal vein and you have to look for them. You really have to prompt a search for these. But in this case, you can see adjacent to the portal vein, there is a suggestion of abnormal flow with uh, disturbed flow in the area of the hepatic arterial stenosis. And uh, a waveform obtained from that area demonstrated a very high peak systolic velocity of 390 degrees. And this area of stenosis was confirmed at angiography. Another patient presenting with stenosis, again, showing a parvus tardis wave form with a decreased resistive index and a delayed upstroke. And uh, centrally, at the uh, region of the anastomosis, there is um, pre-anastomotic velocity of 55 and post-anastomotic of 400. Uh, this is much less common, but can occur. Hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm is the only example I actually have where you can see um, an abnormal cystic structure near the porta hepatis. Um, this one demonstrating a yin yang pattern, but um, the majority of the vessel was not easily found due to overlying gas uh, and due to the location of uh, the pseudoaneurysm, but it was confirmed here with CT scanning. Okay, this is a somewhat common finding um, postoperatively. On day one, you may not see good diastolic flow uh, to the hepatic arteries, and this can be seen due to uh, edema, maybe related to cold ischemia, and you can see a very high resistive index, uh, which actually is, in this case, is really one. And this should be closely followed to establish uh, 
diastolic flow eventually occurring in the transplant. So in this case, follow-up still with a lack of diastolic flow. And then on day five, you can see restoration of the normal hepatic arterial waveform pattern. Uh, this, again, is usually due to edema in, or cold ischemia or may sometimes be related to large collections pressing on the liver. But either way, uh, these are closely followed until the waveform appears normal. And the one other thing that you want to watch in this situation is that the hepatic arterial velocities do not uh, trend down, um, leading to eventual thrombosis. This is a normal portal vein pattern. You can see here a little bit of flow indicating where the anastomosis was performed, but um, you have the same waveform pattern associated with a native liver. Uh, in this case, we can see portal vein thrombosis with echogenic thrombus filling the lumen of the portal vein and absence of flow on the color Doppler images. And yet another example with partial thrombosis, which is extending into the right and left portal veins and partially occluding the lumen at the porta habitus. Uh, portal vein thrombosis affects 1 to 2 percent of transplants. It's much less common, but can be seen either due to excessive vessel length or faulty technique, which we don't really want to put in our reports. Um, patients may present with a hypercoagulable state, or uh, if they've had po previous portal vein surgery, they may be at increased risk for thrombosis. Clinically, this will present with findings of por portal hypertension. Uh, the thrombus appears echogenic usually, um, or just inability to detect the portal vein and uh, presenting with lack of Doppler flow. Stenosis, on the other hand, will present with focal aliasing. And uh, we, you know, it's normal to have a little bit of a stenosis at the anastomosis. Sometimes there is a size mismatch between the donor and the recipient. But uh, when there's a three to four fold increase in velocity uh, relative to the pre stenotic segment, uh, we get a little bit more concerned about stenosis. And especially if the patient is presenting with symptoms of uh, portal hypertension. We, may, may, we may, may want to make a comment on this. And in this situation here, the portal vein, you just see a lot of disturbed flow in this area, some vibration. And uh, when the velocity is obtained, you can see in the pre-anastomotic segment, the velocity is about 19 centimeters per second. And in the region of the anastomosis, it's up to 118. And uh, this patient was actually presenting with some symptoms of portal hypertension necessitating uh, evaluation and treatment for the stenosis. Complications of the hepatic veins and vena cava are much less common, in fact less than 1% of uh, liver transplant complications. Uh, this may be due to technical factors, especially in the early setting, either due to size discrepancy or maybe uh, in pediatric or in small or split transplants, there may be suprahepatic caval kinking from organ rotation. In the delayed setting, stenosis can be seen related to fibrosis in the region of anastomosis or related to fibrosis or stenosis from chronic thrombosis. Uh, cr chronic cable stenosis is actually more common after retransplantation, but is also more common in the pediatric population. Okay, and here's an example of the uh, traditional IVC anastomosis where you can see uh, both the supra and infrahepatic anastomotic sites. It may present with some narrowing. We don't really won't, wouldn't call this stenosis unless um, it was causing uh, abnormal waveforms peripherally from this or uh, symptoms such as lower extremity edema. And this is a ex pictorial example of a piggyback anastomosis where there is preservation of the recipient vena cava here, you can see, and then the vena cava of the graft is anastomosed in an endocyte fashion to the recipient vena cava. At times, the, the donor or the graft uh, stump of the vena cava may thrombose over time, uh, but as long as drainage is uh, preserved from the graft, um, then this is an expected situation. Okay, in this patient, you can see uh, an IVC or stenosis, a stenosis at the anastomosis. This is relatively rare, less than 1%. Again, this more commonly occurs in retransplantation and uh, in uh, the pediatric population. In the acute setting, it may be related to a size discrepancy, but you can see here 
that the hepatic veins, where they're joining into the IVC, there is an abnormal color Doppler picture, and when velocities are obtained in the hepatic vein, you can see that there is uh, absence of the expected phasicity. Further evaluation demonstrated a narrowing in the vena cava with a greater than fourfold increase between the pre and post anastomotic segment. Here at the stenosis, the velocity is up to 275 centimeters per second. And then you can see distally in the vena cava, uh, slow velocity and uh, loss of phasicity. Thrombosis is uh, uncommon but can be seen after stenosis or in the acute setting. You can see here there's echogenic material filling the vena cava. Flow could not be detected on both power and color Doppler, uh, and even with spectral Doppler flow could not be confirmed, and this is a case of IVC thrombosis. Again, these complications are not common, um, but on occasion you may see them. A stenosis we usually call again uh, after a three to four fold increase in velocity. Sometimes you may see reverse flow or absence of phasicity in the hepatic veins. The focus of this talk is, usually, is for a Doppler uh, evaluation of transplants, but I did include a few images for uh, some grayscale abnormalities or abnormalities of the biliary ducts. And here you can see that um, there is dilatation of the common bile duct. And here, which is indicated by the arrow. And the identity of the duct is confirmed on the color images where you can see the adjacent portal vein and the hepatic artery and then again a dilated duct. Now this can occur in up to 25% of transplants and 80% of them occur within the first six months after transplantation. Uh, this may result in biliary leak or stricture, stones or sludge and uh, recurrent disease and usually a leak may occur at the site of T-tube entry. Uh, collections can occur around the liver, usually at the, they can occur near the diaphragm at the caval anastomosis, but can occur anywhere around the periphery of the organ. Uh, hematoma is the most common, which is the one I show here. And you can see that there's echogenic material adjacent to the liver uh, with no flow on the Doppler images. Uh, hematomas can be followed over time where they tend to evolve and become more hypo and then eventually anechoic. Okay, as in summary, liver transplants can present with collections. Um, the hepatic arteries may thrombose or stenose. You may get portal vein thrombosis or stenosis. Same uh, type of complications can occur in the vena cava. And then again, you may get biliary stenosis resulting in biliary dilatation. And one thing I didn't cover is you may get transplants in the liver transplant or recurrent disease. Okay, now moving on to renal transplants. This is actually a little bit uh, faster because the complications are similar, just occurring in a different graft. Renal transplant is the treatment of choice for end-stage liver disease. And again, ultrasound is the imaging method of choice for transplant evaluation and follow-up. The transplant may be placed in the right or left lower quadrant and are most commonly anastomosed to the external iliac artery and vein. The anastomosis is an endocyte type variety with a ureteral neocystostomy. Similar to liver transplants, we want to look at the grayscale appearance of the graft. We want to look for any peritransplant collections. In addition, we want to look at the collecting system and then again evaluate the renal arteries and veins both at the anastomosis and in the parenchyma. Just a few examples of perinephric fluid collections. Uh, you may get hematomas which will resolve over time. Obviously, you want to check, especially in the setting of fever, that these are not infected and becoming abscesses. Uh, because the surgery is performed in the pelvis, you may want to worry about lymphocytes, which occur a little bit farther out. Uh, in the more acute setting, uh, urinomas are part of the differential. Okay, moving on to vascular complications. Uh, this patient actually presented with elevated creatinine, and you can see here uh, ev evaluation of the arcuate vessels demonstrates a somewhat parvus tardis pattern. Just as I showed earlier with uh, hepatic transplants, you can see the resistive index is decreased um, below 0 0.5. And further evaluation in 
near the anastomosis demonstrates an elevation in the peak systolic velocity of the renal artery. Pre-anastomotic, the velocity in the iliac artery is 106 centimeters per second, and in the renal artery, a little bit downstream, you see a parvus tardis waveform uh, with a delayed uh, acceleration. Uh, criteria we use is a velocity greater than 2 meters per second, or a 2 to 1 velocity gradient pre and post anastomotic or pre and post stenotic. You may see focal color aliasing on the color Doppler images. This is the most common vascular complication of transplantation and it can occur in up to 10% of patients. This usually occurs at the anastomosis but can occur at the clamp site due to uh, crush, a crush injury to the vessel. Tardis parvus is only variably present, so if you have the velocity criteria met, you may want to call this uh, diagnosis. And again, you may see spectral broadening or turbulence distally, just distal to the stenosis. Here's one other example where you can actually see morphologically that there is a narrowing at the anastomosis. The color image is abnormal, and the peak systolic velocity is 426 centimeters per second. Okay, moving on. Here's a patient who presented on day two with pain over the graft and sudden oliguria. Usually there is tenderness and there is swelling of the graft. Uh, and you can see in the renal artery, there is an abnormal waveform with reversal of flow during diastole. Now, while this may be somewhat nonspecific, uh, the most important thing that you might want to consider here is renal vein thrombosis. Um, which should be recognized early, possibly if a thrombectomy can be performed and the graft can be saved. Uh, and the causes of this include surgical technique, maybe compression of the renal veins, either by com collections, hematomas or urinomas, uh, or hypovolemia with slower flow in the renal vein. Uh, this can result in infarction and a, a nephrectomy to prevent infection. Oftentimes, the vein may be difficult to find, and uh, it's the arterial waveform with the reversed diastolic flow that could tip you off. In this case, uh, you can see the, the renal artery or the transplant artery is easily detected, but the associated vein is not seen. This is not that common, but again, it's uh, Im important to recognize this abnormality early uh, because you may salvage the graft. This patient presented um, after a transplant three years prior and presented with uh, abnormal brewery over the graft. You can see here that there's an abnormal waveform to the arcuate arteries and arterialization of the renal vein at the hilum. Uh, further imaging demonstrated an abnormal vascular structure near the upper pole of this transplant. Uh, and this is actually a uh, arterial venous fistula. This can occur frequently in transplants as a complication of biopsy, um, but if large, uh, and it may spontaneously resolve or thrombose, but if large marked AV shunting can result in renal ischemia. And uh, you can only see these at times at Doppler, but when large enough may present as a cystic structure in the renal parenchyma. And here you can see that when we perform spectral Doppler in this area, you can see very high both systolic and, and, and diastolic velocities in the fistula. Again, the most common cause of this is percutaneous biopsy, uh, but can be occur occurring in the main renal artery and vein uh, due to surgery. One of the parts of the renal transplant examination is evaluation of the arcuate arteries. In this case, we obtain a resistive index. And we talked about low resistive index as an indication of renal artery stenosis. But uh, you can also get an abnormally high resistive index. And in this case, there is no diastolic flow to the transplant. The resistive index is 1.0. And uh, this is a, a pretty nonspecific finding. Uh, these patients usually present with diminished renal function, and the most common cause would be uh, ATN uh, related to prolonged ischemia or maybe reperfusion injury, and this is the most common 
cause in the early setting. Uh, in the early and the late setting, this can be seen with rejection. Um, and uh, in the appropriate setting, um, can be seen with cyclosporine toxicity. Other causes for a high resistive index may be related to an obstruction or uh, extrinsic collections. And again, you can see here, I listed all the findings that I just discussed. Extrinsic collections, compressing on the kidney, an obstruction of the collecting system, or an abnormality within the graft parenchyma, such as rejection, acute tubular necrosis, or drug nephrotoxicity. Renal vein thrombosis can also present with this finding, but as I showed earlier, uh, it can also present with a reversal of flow in diastole. One other vascular complication includes infarct, and you can see here in the grayscale image, there is a wedge-shaped um, area of abnormal echogenicity, which does not demonstrate flow on the color Doppler uh, compatible with infarct. Infarcts can be due to renal artery thrombosis um, and may be uh, total or segmental due to uh, vasculitis. Patients may present with swelling and tenderness over the graft. Okay, so I've gone over renal artery stenosis and renal vein thrombosis, which are the two most common um, transplant abnormalities. Uh, you can get AV fistulas from biopsies and infarct. Okay, so I've just gone over the more common um, renal transplant abnormalities. Renal artery thrombosis is not so common, and neither is renal vein stenosis, but there was a suggestion of a renal vein stenosis in this examination where the velocity was abnormally increased to 200 22 centimeters per second, but in this case, there actually wasn't a focal stenosis, but actually compression from one of the other uh, known complications of renal transplantation. Here we see a complex multilobulated fluid collection, which is most compatible with a lymphocele, and this collection was actually causing mass effect on the renal vein, uh, causing these high velocities over a long segment, and uh, this collection was actually drained, but did recur and required multiple uh, drainages. Okay, and that ends my talk on both liver and renal transplantation. Thank you very much.